All right, please uh, keep your Bibles open at that uh, genealogy, that family tree, Matthew chapter 1, so that we can uh, prepare together uh, to consider our long-awaited hope with the Lord Jesus. Let me lead us in prayer, and uh, then we'll begin. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the glorious good news of Christmas. We thank you that the long-awaited Savior has come. And so help us now as we consider your word to prepare our hearts for Jesus. In the busyness of this Christmas season, help us not to be distracted from the supreme importance of his coming. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Preparing for Christmas. Preparing for Christmas. Christmas is just around the corner now, isn't it? Just one week to go, but uh, you couldn't have missed that because there's a million cars that have all uh, streamed into Penang uh, for the holidays. Everyone is uh, checking into their hotels, uh, looking for the latest Penang delights, uh, walking by the beach or swimming in the pool. Uh, As Christians too, though, I guess we are preparing to celebrate Christmas, putting up the Christmas tree, if not already, I still haven't done it, Uh, doing some last-minute Christmas shopping, uh, gift wrapping, and all of those things. For many of us, Christmas is a precious time, rest, holidays, family, food. Uh, But whether we're Christian or not here this morning, it's very easy to go through the whole Christmas season, but fail to prepare for what really matters, to fail to remember the whole purpose of why we're having this Christmas season, that God himself came as a man, that he came to rescue us and to rule us. As we do all our Christmas shopping, it's so easy to tune out from those lovely Christmas carols going on in the background. As we prepare all our presents, it's easy to forget about the greatest gift of all. As we enjoy our rest, it's very easy to forget about the eternal rest that Jesus came to bring us. And so my goal this morning is that we would be impacted afresh with the magnitude importance of the coming of Jesus. My goal is that we would be truly prepared for Christmas, that we will prepare not only the tree and the presents, but we will prepare our hearts and our minds to focus on what Christmas is all about, the rescuing rule of the Lord Jesus. But as uh, we begin our Christmas series here in Matthew's Gospel, we are going to do it in a slightly unusual way. We are going to do it with this genealogy, this family tree of strange sounding names. Uh, To us, it may be a rather odd or a boring way to begin a book, let alone a Christmas series. But it's clearly not for Matthew, is it? Uh, And it should not be for us because this genealogy helps us to put Christmas in context. This genealogy shows us right up front why it is so important that Jesus has entered into this world. Now, this Matthew who writes his gospel here, he was one of the 12 apostles. Uh, He's mentioned in chapter 10, verse 3, as a tax collector who left his money to follow Jesus. He's most likely the same as the, uh, the person named Levi in the other gospels. And he's likely writing his gospel after Mark. He borrows much of Mark's material and adds his own somewhere in the 60s AD. But Matthew's big goal is to present Jesus to us as the rescuing ruler of all the nations. He he wants to show us that, yes, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who comes in fulfillment of all those ancient promises, but he is ultimately the king who will be worshipped by the world, by every person in every nation. And we know that because not only how he begins his gospel, but how he ends. You might be familiar with Matthew chapter 28. The risen Lord Jesus says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus is the long-awaited Jewish Messiah, but he is the king of the world. And so to help us to appreciate who this Jesus really is, why his coming really matters, he takes us all the way back to the beginning. He explains his origins. Where does he fit in the course of human history? And he does it with this genealogy. So firstly then, if we are to prepare truly properly for Christmas, we must recognize that Jesus came in fulfillment of God's promises. Jesus comes in fulfillment 
of God's promises. Look how he begins in verse 1 there. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now that verse there, it's an unmistakable reference all the way back to how the Bible begins. Remember at the beginning of the Bible, you have Genesis and the creation of the world. The word for genealogy here in Greek is literally the word Genesis or beginning. And the mention of the book, the book of the genealogy, again, it takes us right back to Genesis and the very beginning. At Genesis 2 verse 4, we read this. These are the generations, or literally the book of the genealogy of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Or again, later in chapter 5 and verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. The point is this, the world began with Adam, with the creation of this world, but the coming of Jesus signals a new beginning. A, a new creation, a new Adam, a new humanity, because that first beginning, well, it ended in disaster, didn't it? Adam turned his back on God. He rebelled against his righteous rule. God's judgment fell. Death entered the world. Blessing turned to curse. Humanity was banished from God's presence. And all of that, but this, is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It's a new beginning. It's a fresh start. It's a new creation. It's a new humanity with a fresh hope that comes with the rescuing ruler, Jesus Christ. And so right from the beginning here, Matthew is telling us, look, if you want to understand Christmas properly, you've got to put Christmas in context. You've got to understand that the coming of Jesus is the culmination and the fulfillment of all of history before this. You see, if you just go and look at one of those uh, nativity scenes that are often around, we don't have one here uh, this year, but with the baby in the manger and the animals around and, and all that, maybe it will emerge for the Christmas play next week. We'll see, right? But if you just look at that, it's very possible you'll miss the point of what Christmas is all about. You'll, you'll miss the, the magnitude importance. I mean, what can be so important about a little baby with some animals uh, around? We need context you see we need to we need the big picture to see why this is so important and matthew gives it the book of the genealogy of jesus christ the son of david the son of abraham and matthew tells us here we'll grasp christmas only if we think about abraham if we think about david and if we think about the promise of the christ who would end the exile and usher in the kingdom of God. So let's look at those three things uh, in turn. Firstly, Jesus came to bring blessing to the nations. Jesus came to bring blessing to the nations. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And verses 2 to 5 trace Jesus' genealogy back to Abraham. Verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. I can never get past that name without thinking about fish and sushi and all that. I'm sorry, I had to say it. Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. Why Abraham? Why is Abraham signaled out here as one of Jesus' important ancestors? Well, of course, it's because God made these covenant promises to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. Promises of blessing for all the nations. Look at Genesis 12 on the screen. God promises Abraham this. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of earth shall be blessed. Now, I think uh, the way I summarize these promises is with the acronym FLOB, right? F-L-O-B, FLOB. It reminds me of one of those uh, movies with the flubber and anyway. Fame, land, offspring, blessing. Fame, 
a great name, land, a promised land, offspring, God will make him a great nation, blessing, blessing for all the nations through Abraham. And these promises, they matter because they represent a reversal of the curse of the fall. Remember in the, in the beginning, God blesses Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but when they reject his rule, when they turn their backs on him, their blessing turns to curse. God drives them out of the garden, death enters the world, blessing turns to curse. But here is the promise that the rescue plan was going to begin. God was going to restore his blessing to the world. God was going to bring humanity back into his presence once more. Here is the point. Jesus is not just the Jewish Messiah. His coming is not just of relevance to some people in this world, but others they can just go and turn to some other God. Jesus, the far-off son of Abraham, is the means of bringing blessing to the world. Every person, every nation. He is the one who will reverse the curse, who will bring people back to God. Uh, and this inclusion of the nations here is anticipated by the four women that find themselves in this genealogy. We've mentioned Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Now, it's actually very rare for women to feature in genealogies in the Bible. So the fact that they're here is surely significant. Now, Genesis 38 suggests that Tamar, who was Judah's daughter-in-law, was in fact a Canaanite, not a Jew. Uh, verse 5 tells us that Rahab was the mother of Boaz. Most famously, she was the Canaanite prostitute who lived in Jericho, who hid the spies uh, that came, Joshua chapter 2. Uh, then there's Ruth, Ruth the Moabites, who came back with Naomi, who said, your people shall be my people, your God shall be my God. She was not a Jew either. She married Boaz and became the great-grandmother of King David. And then there was Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, also not a Jew. Perhaps she wasn't Jewish either. So these four women, they anticipate in a small way the inclusion of all nations, of all peoples, in God's kingdom. Because the blessings of Jesus rescuing rule are not just available to some, they are available to every person from every nation who will come to the Lord Jesus as their king. Jesus is the one who will overturn the curse of the fall, who will take that curse on himself. Jesus is the one who can restore humanity back to God and bring us back to his presence. He is the saviour of all. Now, let me be clear here. When we say that Jesus comes to bring blessing to all of the nations, uh, we're not talking about financial prosperity. I mean, I, whenever we mention blessing or prosperity, uh, maybe your first thought is the prosperity burger at McDonald's. I guess that's coming soon. Uh, and then you think about money, right? But that's not what we're talking about here. Some churches falsely promise, look, become a Christian, God's going to bless you. He'll make you healthy. He'll make you wealthy, successful. He'll give you lots of physical riches, just like he gave to Abraham. That's called the prosperity gospel, and it is wrong. The New Testament makes it clear, Jesus didn't come to bless us with material wealth. He came to bring us into a restored relationship with God. Look, for example, at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in, in advance to Abraham, all nations shall be blessed through you, so those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. But do you see what the blessing to Abraham is in those verses? It's about being justified by faith, verse 8. That is, it's about being declared in a right relationship with God, no longer his enemies but now reconciled to him. And Jesus can offer us that blessing of restored relationship because he takes the curse of sin for us. The passage continues, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs, is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise 
of the Spirit. And what that means is that like Adam and Eve, all of us have sinned against God. We deserve his curse. We deserve death. We deserve separation from his presence. But Jesus came to take that curse for us. Jesus is born so that he might die on the cross in our place, so that now we might have the opportunity to receive the blessing of forgiveness, to have the blessing of restored relationship with God, to have that fresh start, to have that new hope simply by trusting in Jesus. Jesus is the son of Abraham. He is the one who can bring us blessing, a restored relationship with God. I wonder if you have that blessing this morning. All you must do is put your faith in King Jesus. No matter what race, background you are from, Jesus came so that you can be blessed if you will bow to him. So friends, if you've done that already, remember that so many in our world do not yet enjoy this blessing of forgiveness. One of our church members has a very unique Christmas tree. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Uh, there's no decorations on the tree. There's only pictures of people, people of different ethnicities. Uh, at the top of the tree is no star, but there is a cross that represents Jesus. Uh, in the top branches, you'll see there, there are lights uh, representing people groups that know the Lord Jesus. But at the bottom of the tree, far from the cross, are people still in darkness, people groups far from Jesus who don't yet enjoy the blessing of forgiveness. Now, the owner of this tree, they wrote this poem to go with it. You might get sent it later. This tree in our home, there's something amiss. It's not yet beautiful. Much is still unlit. Those above graced with light, the ones below know but night. Unreached, how will they call on him? Unengaged, will they hear, believe? How will they look to the one on the tree, to the son who died for thee? His life he gave not just for you, he died to save all peoples too. If among the bright our songs refrain, how will we light those who remain? This tree in our home, there's much still unlit. Soon he comes. Will it be beautiful? So as we remember that Jesus, the son of Ab was the son of Abraham, we must look out. We, we must remember that this world around us, so many people, is yet to hear this glorious good news of forgiveness and a fresh start with God. We must carry the light to those in the darkness. Jesus came to bring blessing to the nations. Secondly, Jesus came to rule over God's kingdom. Jesus came to rule over God's Kingdom, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So verses 6 to 11 now trace the royal line back to King David. Verse 6, we're told that Jesse was the father of David, the king. Why does it matter that Jesus is descended from King David? Well, it's because not only did God make promises to Abraham, but God made promises to David too. Uh, in fact, in 2 Samuel 7, that Old Testament reading, God promised that it was through the Davidic line, through a Davidic king, that the promises to Abraham would be fulfilled, that God's blessing would indeed go to the world. I wonder if you noticed that. First, God repeats the promises to Abraham in 2 Samuel 7. He says, I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. I will provide a place for my people. So there's fame, land, and I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since I appointed leaders over my people, Israel. I will give you rest, there's the blessing, over all your enemies. So God promises David, flop, fame, land, offspring, blessing, a great name, a place for his people, rest from their enemies, and of course, the greatest offspring of all, a king, the son of God. Look how he continues. When your days are over, and you rest with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom 
He will be the one to build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom. I will be to him a father. He will be to me a son. So God promises King David that one of his descendants will rule forever over God's kingdom. He will be called the son of God. He will build God's temple. And it is through this one, this king, that God's promise to bless the world will be fulfilled. And and unlike his ancestors, Jesus would be the perfect king who wouldn't fail. I mean, look how the genealogy continues in verse 6. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asaph, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Amos, Amos, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So in verse 6, Uh, we're introduced to the third woman in this uh, genealogy. That is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Do you remember what happened with David and Bathsheba? David lusted after Bathsheba as she bathed. He had an affair with her and got her pregnant. And then he had her husband killed to try and cover it up. King David failed badly. And his sins, of course, they lingered in all the kings that followed too. Solomon took 1,000 wives and concubines and turned aside to worship other gods. Rehoboam had the wisest father on earth and rejected godly wisdom and divided the kingdom in two. Yes, there were some relatively good kings, Hezekiah, Josiah, etc. But the idolatry and the wickedness of Israel's kings could not be stamped out. One in this list is Manasseh. He was rock bottom. Look how Manasseh is described in two kings. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed, his altars to false gods. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab king of Israel had done, and he was bad. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. So in God's temple, he worshipped other gods. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced divination. He sought omens. He consulted mediums and spiritus. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing him to anger. And, of course, the the story of the Old Testament is that God had enough. After warning his people enough times through the prophets, his judgment fell. The temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was burned to the ground, and God's people were deported to Babylon. It's interesting, isn't it? Matthew makes no attempt whatsoever to hide Jesus' shady past, right? Yes, he was from a kingly line, but he was from a kingly line that failed so badly, that was wicked and idolatrous and murderous and faced the judgment of God. And yet, of course, we go back to 2 Samuel 7. God's promises anticipated all of that as well. Look how those promises continue. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So despite all of these failures of all these kings before, God's plan would not be derailed. He, He would still send a perfect king to usher in an eternal kingdom, his promise continued until the coming of Jesus. And so what we appreciate in this genealogy is that Jesus is the perfect king. Jesus is the king who 
always lived under God's rule. Jesus is the king who will never fail. He is the king who will never be unjust, who will never be self-serving. He is the king who is always loving, who is always faithful. He is the king, the one king that will never disappoint us. The one king we can give our lives to wholeheartedly. He was the perfect son of God. He was the perfect king. And this genealogy tells us he was born not of man. He was born of God. He was a divine king. Uh, I don't know if you noticed how the pattern of the genealogy is broken when you get to verse 16. All the way through it says, David the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and so on. All the fathers listed. Until you get to verse 16. Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. The point is, Jesus was not fathered by Joseph. Jesus' true father was God. We'll see more of this next week. The point is this, Jesus is the divine son of God. He is the perfect king. He is God in human flesh, the one who would never fail, who would rule forever. So again, we'll never properly prepare for Christmas until we recognize that that baby in the manger is also the Lord of heaven and earth. We'll never be properly prepared for Christmas until we are ready to bow before him as the perfect divine king who will usher in a perfect kingdom. We will never be ready until we obey him as our ruler. Well, finally, Jesus came to bring restoration to sinners. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And the final part of this passage emphasizes that Jesus was the Christ. That is, he was the promised Messiah who would end the exile and usher in the age of salvation. We saw earlier that God's people were exiled to Babylon because of their immorality. And it's true that sin dominates this passage throughout. Rahab was a prostitute. Uh, Tamar dressed it and acted like a prostitute. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. God's people prostituted themselves after other gods, like Manasseh did. His judgment fell. They were exiled to Babylon. But all that sin, of course, it's just like our sin, isn't it? But just like Adam at the beginning, we too fail. We too turn aside. We, we worship other things. Even at Christmas, we forget the Savior and we start serving ourselves. We make it all about us with the presents and the holidays and so on instead of about him. But this genealogy is a, is a glorious testimony to the grace of God, the love of God. This story could have ended at any point. It could have ended with Judah's wicked deed with Tamar. It could have ended with David's affair with Bathsheba. It could have ended with any of the sinners that are listed in this family tree. It could have ended with the exile. But it didn't. The story continued. The story continued. The story continued. Past judgment to salvation. And so verses 12 to 16, they trace out the return to the land. Verse 12 says, after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the one who led the Israelites back from exile in 539 BC. He was the Davidic descendant who began rebuilding the temple, just like the prophets had prophesied. But of course, Zerubbabel was not the perfect king. Zerubbabel didn't bring the blessing to the nations because that return from the exile, it pointed to a much greater return from a much greater exile. The return, uh, uh, the exile of humanity from the Garden of Eden and the return of all humanity back into the presence of God. And so the story continues, verse 13. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, Abiud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Eliud, Eliud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. It was Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, 
who would come as the rescuing ruler and bring about the ultimate return, not just for rebel Israel, but for all humanity to bring us back into his presence. And so, and so we will never prepare properly for Christmas until we recognize that Jesus came to bring us out of exile, out of God's judgment, and into God's presence. He came to die and to rise so that every sin can be forgiven and we can be gathered once again into the presence of God in that new creation where sin and death are no more. So that as we come to Christmas, if we only just focus on the food and the presents and the family and the holidays, instead of the forgiveness of our sins, well, then we will have totally missed the point. See, Christmas is all about fresh starts. Christmas is all about perfect hope. Christmas is about restored relationship with God. And if we are to celebrate properly in this coming week, we must prepare our hearts with these glorious truths. We must be impacted afresh by the magnitude of Christmas, the coming of our rescuing ruler. And I think this is what Matthew wants to do as he closes this strange passage with another strange verse in verse 17. Uh, he wants us to see the magnitude importance of Jesus. He wants us to grasp that he is the center point of history. Look at verse 17 again. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now, if you look closely at the Old Testament genealogies which are used to create this one, then you'll realize that Matthew has deliberately omitted some names. He's deliberately created these blocks of 14 names. Actually, some of them have only got 13. Why? He wants us to observe a pattern and he wants to make a point. Now, why 14? Here is one theory. It may or may not be correct. All right, 14 is two times seven. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. But 14 seems to be a play on the name of David. If you spell David in Hebrew letters, uh, then you would spell it D-W-D. If you give them a number based on their order in the Hebrew alphabet, then you have 4104. You add it together, I mean 464. You add it together, you get 14, right? Maybe it's another way of saying that Jesus is the king and all of history is about the coming of the king. Perhaps this passage divided up in this way. Part one, the arrival of kingship. Abraham to David. Part two, the loss of kingship, David to the exile. And then part three, the coming of the true king, exile to Jesus the Christ. So that in this way, all of history can only be made sense of in the light of the kingship of Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the anointed king who came to rule everyone and everything. He is the divine son, the rescuing ruler, the agent of global blessing. The point is this, the coming of Jesus is the center point of history. The point at which our calendar moves from BC, before Christ, to AD, and a Domini, in the year of the Lord, King Jesus stands right at the center of it all. The world exists through him and for him. Our rescuing ruler who can bring blessing to the nations, who will rule a perfect kingdom, he stands at the center of everything. And so what a tragedy then to celebrate Christmas as if it was all about Santa Claus or if it was all about presents or it was all about family or it was all about holidays. It's all about him. It's all about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Christ. Please don't take Christmas out of context. We must prepare our hearts so that Jesus is placed firmly at the center of our plans, not only at Christmas, of course, but throughout the year, every day, every moment. 
But as I close here, let me leave us with some concrete suggestions to keep King Jesus central this Christmas. Firstly, come. Come to church at Christmas. Now, I'm not just saying that because I'm going to be here and I'll be lonely if you don't come and uh, keep me company. Isn't I'm not insecure like that. It's, it's fine. Don't worry about my mental health. Right? It's because it's a concrete action to say to yourself, your children, your family, all around you, that Jesus is first. He is your king and your Christmas is all about him. You come to church. You're reminded of who he is, why he came. Secondly, read. Read your Bible at Christmas. In our family, what we try to do uh, before we open the presents is we read through some portion of the Christmas story and we pray. It doesn't matter. You could read from Matthew. You could read from Luke. You could read from John or somewhere else about Christmas. It doesn't really matter. But read God's word. Remind yourself and your family, what it's all about. King Jesus, pray. Thirdly, serve. Make plans to serve other people at Christmas. Because when Jesus is left out of the picture, then Christmas very quickly becomes all about ourselves. I mean, you see how selfish children become at Christmas, don't they? I mean, the fighting over the presents and all of this. It's my present. You can't play with it, all that. I mean, adults can act the same in more kind of civilized ways, but actually we're not much different. But we remember, we celebrate that King Jesus came to serve. He left the glories of heaven. He was born in a manger and he came to die on a cross. So how can we celebrate by being selfish? That makes no sense. Use Christmas to serve others. Be generous with what you have, especially to the needy. Perhaps invite people to your home who would otherwise be alone. Maybe you can think of the single person, the widow, foreigner who's away from home. Serve them. Welcome to them to your home. Buy them a present for themselves. Fourthly, share. Use Christmas to share the good news. Could you invite friends or family to church or, or to your family celebration? Could you include them when you are reading your Bible and praying before you open the presents and tell them why you are celebrating? Because this Christmas, it's a monumental news for the world. It's not just for ourselves. Christmas is the greatest gift of all. It's the fulfillment of all God's promises. It's the center point of all history. It brings salvation for sinners and blessing for the nations, and this is the best opportunity you have any time in the year to share that good news with others. Well, that's close. We're all preparing for Christmas, food, presents, vacation. It's all fine. It's all fun. Let's not forget what really matters. Let us prepare our hearts to welcome King Jesus, our rescuing ruler. Come, read, serve. Share. Let's give Jesus his central place as king this Christmas. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are the gracious, loving, faithful God. That first Christmas you sent your Son in fulfillment of all your promises to be our Savior and King. Father, we thank you for the fresh start, for the new hope that you offer in the coming of your Son. We thank you for his perfect rule that will never fail or disappoint. And we do pray, Lord, that as we prepare for Christmas just next week, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, that we would bow before King Jesus, that we would reflect again on his magnitude importance, not only for us, but for everyone. We pray that many more people would come to hear the good news and bow before him. We pray in Jesus' name.